three people and you're going to have four weeks to do something. <laughs> it started out of pure stubbornness, which is great. <laughs> Without necessarily meaning to, I think we found this quite interesting niche. No, we did some stuff and the fact that it's invisible means it worked. <laughs> I think art is encoded knowledge and uh, experience. At that time, we were really fascinated by the whole transmedia concept. That was it, not the time-travelling robot idea that we had. Hello, I am Sam Fry and welcome to Technique. This is the podcast where we speak to artists about technology. This month's episode is named Fashion as I am interviewing someone whose background is in the fashion industry. And as a result, we end up talking quite a lot about the challenges that industry faces. Who am I speaking to? It's Sam Cotton. So yeah, my name is Sam, Sam Cotton. I suppose I work across different multidisciplinaries, but predominantly over the last 12 years, I've worked as a luxury men's and women's wear designer and more, more, more recently been sort of focusing more across creative direction or consultancy. As he mentioned, Sam's background is in fashion design. However, he has also been working on some AI and 3D printing based digital artworks, which build on what he learned at university, where he studied philosophy. In this episode, we talk about Sam's experience in the world of fashion, but also how he has been drawn back towards his interests in art, philosophy and form. So let's jump into the interview, where I start by asking Sam about how he got involved in the fashion industry. Mine was a weird route. I actually started off studying sciences for A-level. I then went on to do a degree in philosophy. And then after the first year, I found the sort of part of working towards meaning and process and the, the philosophers that I was inspired by then. I found that the, the actual just output of writing quite limiting and I wanted to see if there's a way of basically being able to continue my interest in technology and materials and art and I basically forged that course at Falmouth in Cornwall into a fine art course. There I worked a lot with sculpture. I was at the time trying to do like 3D printing. This was like 14 years ago. Um, so I was trying to do 3D printing to develop new materials, do fabrics, and a lot of the stuff in the end ended up being quite large-scale sculptures printed in sort of different materials that you'd usually expect from 3D printing at the time, which was like obviously polymers and plastics, but I was using like cement, heat, brass and stuff like that. Obviously came out of uni, not many jobs available in that kind of field. So um, basically I, I moved to London because I got a commission doing some illustrations for Karl Lagerfeld, who used, used to be the designer at Chanel. And then um, I just saw this other opportunity at Alexander McQueen and it was looking for somebody who was materials, textiles and sort of illustration, fine art. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds like all the things I'm interested in. And then literally from there, I just kind of got wrapped up in the world with it, I suppose. I taught myself out of school how to pattern cut, how to learn how to obviously be in there, learn how to research and design for a fashion world. I just really loved the fact that coming from a degree where I'm interested in like anthropology, sociology, society, all these kind of sort of fundamental big bracket ideas, they kind of, a lot of that kind of boiled down into fashion, like especially with functionality or innovation within textiles or the, the impacts of fashion and materials themselves. Yeah, I suppose that's where it all started. And then, yeah, after then, I just obviously forged a kind of unusual career, I suppose. How did that first commission come about with Carl Lagerfeld? I applied for it, actually. I saw, um, is it UCA or UAE? I can't remember. They used to have this website called like Work Opportunities and people would post jobs on there. I don't know whether it's still there. It must be. And I just remember seeing it and I'd done quite a lot of like anthropomorphic figures in my work looking at like structure and things. And I was like, oh, I could probably do that. So I just sent all of these illustrations off to the job application and they were like, yeah, do it. So kind of weird in terms of you were talking about sculpture and 3d printing if we're talking 14 years ago there, there weren't really easy to access 3d printers as you might get now what kind of stuff were you doing at that point and and that interest in sculpture and how does that translate into fashion as well it's a good point like form has always been something i've been interested in and i think 
the impact of form on others, on society. Also, the just the sort of beautifulness of the biological has always in, interested me as well. I used to always draw faces as a kid and eyes, and that kind of thing. I think always really like inspired me into like wanting to learn more about science, learn more about the human body. Yeah, I suppose it kind of authentically I like then led that into like how do I start making these actual physical whether it's like materials or textures, how do I start to engineer that? And the things that have occurred, the things that have impacted our bodies or have impacted the, the ways buildings have been created or sculptures or whatever have been made. I was like, how can I challenge that? How can I push that into a new division where I suppose ultimately it's, you're losing control of your own physical ability to create art and you're giving that, giving a bit of an opportunity to a machine to do it as well, which I'm really, uh, really interested by. I've always really been interested in the, the theory of non-free will, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, it's this, this idea that we actually, as humans, we don't have as much control over free will, free will as we think we do. Ultimately, the decisions that we make are processes that occur through nurture, through our DNA, through experiences that we've had, and those choices that are made, we kind of couldn't have done anything other than that. So it's not about a specific route you're following. It's about chaos basically occurring. And there's only really one form that could happen. So that opened my eyes up to thinking about within art, if we are quite fallible and the mistakes that we make, we think of as being special because we're making mistakes. There's no reason why machines can't make mistakes. There's no reason why you can give sort of like this opportunity of chaos to a machine and see where that takes you basically. Then being in the fashion world, so working for Alexander McQueen, so what were you doing there and, and how's that gone from from what you were doing back then through to what you're doing now in, in partly consulting roles as well around fashion? I was focusing on a mixture of things like digital design for like print or textiles or weaving. I was working on physical, traditional tactile processes like dyeing, screen printing, stuff that I'd secretly never done before, but I just kind of made it up as I was going along there. And then there was like a lot of hand drawing, a lot of like weaving and like attempting to make new fabrics or whatever. And the idea is that you have all these samples. Because, I mean, there was quite a lot of us. There was about six in the textile team. So there was like about four graphic designers and two material designers. And we were all just like working on everything. This is I don't know, this is kind of quite similar to what most a lot of fashion businesses did when it, I first started. They just get loads of interns in for as cheap as possible and then get them all working. But again, it's, it was an amazing opportunity for me because it was a stepping stone for the rest of the stuff that I did. So I did that. I was there for about a year. Then I went to another brand called J.W. Anderson, who he, at the time, was quite a young designer. While I was there, he got acquired by LVMH Group. He obviously sold off his business to them. He then went to company called Luove, which is like a massive luxury brand. And I was basically working there as the lead on materials. It was great there because I literally got to see how a person could build a business and turn it from something that you were doing in your own house to like this massive industry, basically. Then there was a recession, <laughs> which was great. So funnily enough, me and my friend, we started a menswear brand that was in 2010, I think. And we were really lucky. We did pretty well. We were stopped in about 70 stores um, around the world, like Mr. Porter, Liberty, Selfridges, 10 Corsa Como, Isitan, like stores around like Japan and Europe and America and stuff. Then we won multiple awards like GQ Men of the Year Award, the British Fashion Award, International Walmart Prize Award, LVMH, like loads of stuff like that. Did collaborations with Mr. Porter with, uh, we had a two season contract with Lacoste where we were consulting for them with a collaboration. Yeah, we were really lucky. That went on for about six or seven years and we were like ran all by our kind of own accord and we didn't have any investment. <clears throat> and ultimately the the industry itself is just so unforgiving without investment. Like to actually be able to afford to run a wholesale business is just incredibly hard with fashion because you, without going into too much detail about like how it works, which is quite boring, but it's like if you take a million pounds worth of orders in a year, you have to obviously pay. Usually it's split it's, um, times two, so you'll have to find 500,000 just to produce it. You've got six months, well, less than that, probably got three or four months to produce it. Most stores that buy don't give you deposits if they're big. They'll only pay you after you've released the stock to them. So, for example, a store like Selfridges, 
would pay maybe 10% discount on 30 days, 8% discount on 60, 5% discount on 90. So you basically have to find 500 grand from somewhere to produce this stuff, to then pay your factories, to get all the materials, to then release it to Selfridges even before you get money, which could be take 90 days. So it was just impossibly hard. And yeah, sadly, we closed the company, I think in about 2016, I think it was. And then after then, I just started, I, I kind of just needed to sort of rejig my career a bit. I started to feel like I wasn't doing the things I originally started doing, which was like my interest in materials, my interest in like um, innovation and function and design. So I started working with the University of Central London, a team in a group called the Institute of Making there. And I work, was working with a girl called Anna Pajowski, who is a material scientist. She's been on this podcast. Has she? Ah, yeah, she does real talk, doesn't she? She does, yeah. Yeah, that's her podcast, yeah. And yeah, so we were we were working together on trying to bring in focusing things like nanotechnology, meta materials, 4D stimulus materials. Um, we worked with Pucci in Florence, Mont Blanc. And yeah, it was really exciting. It was like, I mean, this is the thing about fashion. Fashion is very, very old fashioned, hence I already have the name. And they don't like technology they don't really know how to deal with it especially these old luxury houses and personally i could just see how quickly the industry was changing all around like industries were changing all around it like automation cars just bio everything architecture just everything was just innovating 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 and especially even with sportswear sportswear was becoming the most practical understandable clothing that affected people's lives and luxury was being left behind so yeah, we worked with them and then I got approached by Valentino, who are a luxury house in Rome. And I moved there two years ago and was working there as their head of menswear. So uh, yeah, working across like the catwalk shows, the ready to wear. And then, yeah, and then COVID hit. <laughs> and then I came back here and I've started working on art projects basically. I saw something recently where someone was effectively saying that innovation, even as a term, is dead, is is gone because in reality, everyone is setting themselves up in terms of their organisation and the way that they're structured with innovation at, at the heart of what they're doing anyway. So, in the same way as digital was a was a big term for a, a while, and now we'll you know what what is and what isn't digital everything is kind of digital now um innovation is quite similar where everyone is trying to be closer to their customers understand and test things quickly they're all trying to be able to make these big bets and then iterate on on what they're what they're doing you must have seen that to an extent in the fashion world as as well but do you just feel that shift and change hasn't been there or is it a case that actually in fashion you're always going to be to an extent quite close to who you're selling to maybe closer than some of those other markets might have been 100 percent. i think the point of me trying to do this was to without it being sort of disingenuous work on a way with a philosophy and an aesthetic that wasn't there because it had to be it's there well so you know it should so when i say it shouldn't because it had to be more like because i see what you're talking about the rest of the industry is becoming so innovative and digital now because of covid and it's like oh this has happened so we've got to do this and that's the problem that I have with fashion. It's like you have a lot of brands who are going, right, okay, we need to do digital catwalks. Okay, we need to be like basically a digital first advertising company. It's all just so reactive that when you take what the brand means and what it stands for and you try and put it into this like digital hemisphere, it just doesn't fit and it doesn't work and it looks strange and that, that people are really struggling how to, how to work out authentically really so for me i was like we should be looking at this before it happens it's like looking at i mean i don't want to use the term global warming but it's like don't just watch there and not expect like what's going to happen the same as with virologists have been saying about these pandemics that are going to occur don't sit back there and let, let it happen work from the, the starting point develop new concepts push materials in a way that haven't been pushed before be on top of all of this stuff so when you need to go digital first like I suppose like China now are like a fully digital first nation. They've been that way since SARS. And now we see ourselves um, heading in that direction. But I don't know, no one just seems to be like looking at the most 
honest way of doing it, really. What what got you interested in taking a, a sort of a sidestep from the fashion world into something that was a bit more contemporary art or digital art? A couple of things, really. One was frustration. The fashion industry can be very slow in take up. Even the companies I was working with, with Anna in and, and, and um, the Institute of Making, like they're just very, very old fashioned. And to get things running through these machines, like especially brands that are then attached to like a holding group like LVMH or Richmond, like they don't know what to do and they don't know how to do it. And you give them the answers and they get excited at the start. But after a while, they start going like, oh, well, what about this? And what about this? And you're like, trust me, trust me. Which is ironic now because everyone is in this mad panic in fashion about trying to find innovative, innovative materials or materials that are fully sustainable or like whatever. So I think I just got a bit frustrated. And the other thing was when I started at uni, it was pure, pure art, pure philosophy. And it was pure trying to get to a point of meaning with what I was doing and raise questions myself for people to look at. And I think a step so far away from that, working more in this like commercial functional world of that, that fashion is that I then just thought I actually kind of want to be back here. Ultimately I haven't stopped thinking about these concepts and I just thought maybe I should actually go back into it from where I started, try and grow that concept again and then start asking myself more questions basically. Which art piece did you start with? This was something I've just thought about for a long time actually. And it, I've always been interested in trying to work with, as I said before, this idea of non-free will, this idea of giving something like um, neural networking or AI or machinery the ability to be creative and to make mistakes and to be creative in what they generate. That's been my philosophy that I've been interested in since uni. And I think now we're getting to a stage where there's more that can be achieved from this. Like I've, I've been trying to speak to like, automation industries and try and use their machines to create havoc and there's an artist i love called john cage sorry and also john kale who work with this process called prepared piano and prepared piano is basically like you put metal instruments into the back of the piano strings and when you resonate the key it makes these really unusual noises and then to then write music that reacted in that way i was always like that's just so amazing to combine human touch with mechanicalisms and then theoretical errors so uh, when i was thinking of this i was rereading wittgenstein's tractatus and i was reading like a bit of deleuze and derrida and Guattari, who all focused on linguistics well wittgenstein argued that language itself is quite limiting because to to get to a certain meaning or to true meaning because language in itself has evolved in the society that it's been in other societies that have joined into it whether it be for english like the french or even the Swedish or wherever else, they've actually combined with that language and created something organically. Nothing's really ever prepared to be that way. It just occurs that way. So sometimes he felt things like negative culture and various other things like problems with the sort of fragility and fallibility of words, words when you put them under a microscope. It means you can't actually get close to meaning. So I was like, well, how could you arrive at meaning using sort of like language principles like synchronics, diachronics, and I just started looking at the evolution of language and like how language got to where it was. And then I was like, well, if you input data of language from the earliest that we have, and then you bring that data forward through different generations to the language and definitions that we have now, neural networking and AI can work out what that path is and see how that's evolved there. And I was like, what happens if we move that path forward and we omit the things that Wittgenstein argued were damaging, things like cultural slurs or whatever. And we've done this small process and it's pretty amazing. Like it's the AI has just started developing like progressions of words, but then it also is creating new words, but it also doesn't just create the words, it creates the meanings and definitions of what the words are as well. And we started playing with it to see if we can produce like idioms as well. So we're getting things out of it that are like amazing. And I suppose the point is, is that I want to show how beautiful language is and I want to show how it evolves and it grows like an organism. Before, when I started doing this, I found all these like amazing old books from a friend who actually studied English at King's. And it was basically, this was the process in how we started to like put 
the information in. So this book is amazing. It's called Key Words of Vocabulary of Culture and Society. You know, uh, humanity, for example, it starts off like explaining what humanity is in, term, in terms of its complex group of words. Then it goes into like where the first mentioning of humanity was. Then it talks about how it goes into the next part and how like sort of old literature have used it, like Othello or in, in Hamlet or Othello. And then it goes into like how then that's evolved into things like humanism. Da, 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 da. I mean, this is what's going to be really difficult when we do it. We had to like input. He was inputting in all of this stuff so that the AI could kind of understand how that that works. And then we build like an algorithm that functions in that same way. So for each word, it then kind of grows but this is the reason why i called it a rhizome because rhys rhizomatic philosophy it's just like a root system so for to get to one word the root system around it is like insane so at the moment we're just trying to balance off that by trying to find the right literature to do it so it's really complicated it's like putting a puzzle together backwards it's like insane so so effectively trying to map the links from one thing to another and what what's changed in between and then and seeing if there's a pattern there between that that word and and trying to just make that into an algorithm which is like obviously every word has different contexts and meanings but ultimately you can kind of start the more you add in the more the algorithm starts to learn and work out how to change depending on what that word is and all of that is happening and building out and then it just boils down to like this one word but then that one word also then boils out to a definition we're really excited about the idioms because like when it's built this whole sort of map of words and languages, if we start inputting stuff like that, it's just going to create some absolute bollocks. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how, how you want to and are showing this work? We wanted to just show it in an open narrative sort of space. So it's all, it would all be through words for the main exhibition anyway it would all be through purely communication of the language through ai so if it's like a dictionary that's been developed at the end of it then that dictionary would be narrated basically the idea was to have a room with a lot of speakers that all just post in and to be honest i've been thinking more of concept rather than how i'm going to lay it out but ultimately it needs to be output of the definitions the words just narrated slowly through in one room obviously there's a lot of beautiful imagery that comes off it i mean i think i've got down here actually that when you start building like rhizomatic data you get this one image here that's like this big scatter graph where you've got like i think it's this to lose guatari uh, individuation but even things like that, I think, are quite beautiful visuals for how the actual work works, if you know what I mean. One of my favourite exhibitions actually was a, an IBM-funded one at MoMA. I think it was the MoMA in New York. And there they had a lot of amazing seminal artists that have worked with IBM, the IBM Art Corporation Fund, who then, as well, next to their artwork, they were showing all the data, like the data cards that were put into the computers to do things. And I was like... This stuff is art, like it's beautiful. So I wanted to make sure that whenever I show mine, I want to show that data as well, because I think that's as much art. There's that book, Information is Beautiful, is that what it's called? I, I can't remember now. But it's uh, basically different ways of visualising data. And there is interesting thing, because in a way, there's one thought, which is don't show all the workings. But actually, a lot of people will geek out a bit on that. But also, as you say, if you can visualise the connections between information or or a bit of that process that visual in itself is it is its own interesting art piece yeah 100 percent. there's an artist i really love called weird core who um works with apex twin and like people like that for apex twins last video it's like apex twins from cornwall i think they're both from cornwall actually and they wanted to make this new release for his song and it was um the concept was what would happen if an ai or some kind of like half ai being or conscious being would be given like acid and what its reaction would be and the video is just like binary tripping like weird like concepts i'll, I'll send you a link afterwards but it's insanely beautiful but it's basically just all built out of like data and it's amazing <laughs> The other piece of work you shared, can you talk a little bit about that, which it seems a lot more kind of sculpture based, I guess? Yeah. So this is kind of like a follow up from what I was doing at university. So I'd mentioned it before. It's about this idea of non-free will 
with this idea of digital printing or weaving or Scott or, or yeah these these kind of machines and allow them to make mistakes and to, to build whatever they want. Like at the time when I was trying to use new materials to, to digitally print with, I still haven't seen many people trying to do that. So I was like, I'd like to go back to using things like cement or brass or clay and various other things. What I kind of wanted to do was the theory is that the seven states of consciousness, the states are like waking, dreaming, so REM, non-REM, transcendental consciousness, cosmic consciousness, glorified state of cosmic consciousness and unified states of cosmic consciousness. And if you go on to, if you go into like sort of scientific data led websites, you have all of these papers that have got all this information showing all the ECG data like that, that show how these different parts of the brain and your reactions in the brain are sort of separated out into these seven areas. So I was like, okay, well, if you take all this information and you feed it through uh, an algorithm and you set the parameters of the algorithm to build, I don't know, for example, like you set behavioral data or physiological data, and then you set like certain parameters into 3D software or into an algorithm, algorithmic 3D software, you can cont- you could start to use things like Boolean operations or path mod- modules and let it sort of like a little petri dish grow with all the information you put into these like weird sort of organic shapes and that's what started to happen and we had seven different shapes that are kind of in the process now one of them is formed and looks pretty good the, 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 obviously as well we have to like put restrictions on like because some of them were going like 30 foot wide and then like two two inches like thick in the center so they're just going to break immediately so we had to like constrain proportions like that but the idea is that there'd be these seven states of consciousness each in different materials and then those seven states together each of them built on its own pretty well it built whatever it wanted to and the mistakes and whatever it made we just had to go along with basically and you put the seven together and you get theoretically full consciousness so interesting and so what, what material would you be using? Basically, it's any materials that can be melted down to liquid form. So cement, brass, bronze, alloy, we have like an aluminium, clay. Yeah, there's about seven of them. So we've got a printer in Switzerland, uh, this amazing guy. And yeah, he's just like, yeah, you can start putting things into my machines and print and stuff, which is pretty good. Because that's the hardest convincing thing to do is to get them to actually go like, yeah we'll let you potentially like put that through our machine yeah it must it must be hard actually when it gets to a certain scale to get the right machinery because it's, it's all well and good doing something on a small scale and or or even you know prototyping something because the access to that machinery is a lot easier but as soon as you start going to kind of an industrial size or industrial materials to do it, it must become a lot harder well it's and that's the problem is like every well, for me as well i, I don't want to make like little sculptures i want to make like big sculptures so it's always like people will always say that as well they're like oh we can test it out on the um the sort of hobby works and i'm like yeah but ultimately i'd, I'd like it to be big so uh let's yeah, just yeah. get the hobby works and we'll go straight to So what, what's what's next for you, Sam? What's what are you looking to do next? Is it continuing with some of this work and and actually getting it out there somewhere, exhibiting it at whatever point that becomes easier to do? Yeah, quite a few things I've been working on. I'm starting to rework on similar stuff to what I was doing with Anna at UCL. I've had a few people approach me about trying to move that forward. So I'm working with a, I thought what would be a lot easier if I work with a 3D designer, who's one of my friends, digital 3D, to just start conceptualizing these material processes into 3D. And then people can see it first because everyone in fashion industry is so like uh, visual. So I'm starting to like build this kind of semi consultancy brand where there's just loads of like, explanations and details on how if you use like i don't know by stable exotic materials or what would happen if like you used a specific type of meta material as like another material what it would do and you show that and then so i'm working on that at the moment i'm also i have my own brand as well which is called raymond which is less well it's not tech at all so there's no point talking about it <laughs> and then i am potentially going back into doing consultancy i've got a meeting on on monday but i think we're finally getting to a point where everyone realizes that 
you can consult from home, which is what I think has been the hardest step for most businesses. They've realized that business has to go on. They have to keep moving their, their business forward, especially this, this company in question. They are a pretty big business digitally. So they sell a lot of their clothes for e-commerce. And I've been like, we're in different countries, but everyone's not even in your offices. So I can still do this. So hopefully that will go through on Monday. And then there's this art stuff, which I really want to still keep pushing. Um, I don't know really with that. Like, I'd obviously love to show it. I'd quite like to at some point be able to work with like some sort of institution to develop it. Yeah, I wanted to try and work out a way of working with a company who actually understands that world and believes in that can potentially help me as I move forward in terms of me showing how beautiful digital is and how beautiful it is to use like neural networking and machine learning and technology for art. And then the other thing as well as I've been in conversation with about potentially going back to do a master's in my spare time at a London university, but just lots of stuff in my head basically like normal that's the end of the episode i'd like to say a big thank you to sam cotton for being interviewed if you are interested in finding out more about his work, you can go to samuelcotton.co.uk. Sam also mentioned his personal brand, Raymond, which you can find more about by visiting raymond.eu. That's R-A-I-M-E-N-T. Thank you so much for listening. And as we've mentioned before, if you have liked listening, then it would be great if you could subscribe to the podcast and also rate it five stars on iTunes or wherever you listen. It really only takes a couple of seconds and it really helps us in terms of the listings. We will, of course, be back again next month with another episode. But in the meantime, take very good care of yourself. Goodbye. Goodbye.